Hey friends, hope you're having a great day. I just got back from Grandfather Mountain. I've got my bear mug that says Grandfather Mountain and my t-shirt and a couple other things to show you. Uh, this is my third year in a row doing a trip out to Grandfather Mountain. It is one of my favorite places. It's like my Disney World. Um, and this is kind of like that trip report video where I go into all the details after the um, like entertaining highlight reel video of the trip. So like I said, we're going to go into a lot of the details, things you need to know before you go. And quick disclaimer, uh, this should not be taken as safety advice whatsoever. Uh, it's a tough trail system and uh, all hikers hike at their own risk. We're also going to be taking a look at the map for a good part of this video just to help as a visual aid with uh, what I'm explaining. So first thing we'll get into is separating the attraction from the state park. So the attraction is um, an area that can only be accessed by prepaid admission. And that usually ranges like $8 to kids up to $22 for adults. And um, that sounds like a pretty steep price, but it includes access to the animal exhibits, the museum and restaurant, the gift shop, uh, even closer access to the swinging bridge. The swinging bridge can be accessed from outside trailheads, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But so that area can't be accessed from the outside trails you pay to get in. And right now they're doing um, prepaid online admission only, but it's really not that big of a hassle. In fact, I bought my ticket uh, on my phone at my campsite the morning of. And it, on a weekend, it's a different story, but I went on a weekday and uh, just kind of pulled it up the time that I was gonna be there and bought my ticket. And then when I got there, you know, they already had my reservation in the system. So um, I could do it while on the trail. It was really not a big deal. And it wasn't a timed ticket as in like they were ushering me out after a certain time. Um, I bought the ticket to enter at 10 a.m. and I was on the trail hiking uh, until the late afternoon. So pretty much all day. And the question kind of comes up, is it worth the $22? It just depends. For me, it totally is because they give you this really nice hiking map. They give you a CD tour. And so you put that into your CD player and it plays, you know, cute little music and a guy tells you the entire history of the park as you drive through. Um, so if you really enjoy having that like tourist experience with it, um, it's definitely worth it. And this is also good for families who aren't, you know, able to actually get out and hike. You can still see the beautiful views and experience uh, Grandfather Mountain in the ways that you're able to. And me, I just love both. I love getting out there and doing the really strenuous hiking, but then I also love to, you know, go in the gift shop and get a bear mug or, you know, a patch for my backpack and experience like the museum, things like that. So uh, it appeals to a range of people, but that steep price uh, for admission when you compare it to other state parks where it's like between five or $10, you're getting so much more uh, with the attraction at Grandfather. And I mentioned animal exhibits. They do animal encounters uh, throughout the day, different times. And so you can watch an entire presentation on the bears, cougars, elk, the animals that they have, and their habitats are really, really well maintained, very beautiful. And if you've got little kids, you know, they would just be blown away by uh, just these huge habitats with bears walking around and add to that the educational element, them doing the presentations and stuff. So yeah, really fantastic experience overall with the attraction. To me, it's never seemed like you don't get enough for your money. But again, that's just my own view of it. Now let's talk about the trail system and accessing the park from outside of the attraction. So there's two main parking lots you can access uh, the grandfather hiking trail system from. There's the profile trailhead, which is a larger uh, parking lot with facilities like a bathroom. And then there is Boone Fork off of the parkway that 
more resembles one of those like overlook pull-offs that you'd see on the parkway. No facilities there. And uh, we'll take a look on the map in a minute. But you can access all of the trails from either of those two parking areas down to the swinging bridge. But you cannot get to the museum and restaurant and animal exhibits um, from there because there's a section of road that separates the swinging bridge from the museum and all of that. And it is monitored. Road walking is not allowed. Not only is that like a safety concern with cars coming around the sharp turns, but also you'd be kind of cheating the system and uh, getting in without paying. So um, you can get to the swinging bridge. Just know that the whole way that you hike down, you gotta hike all the way back up. And there were a couple people when I went who were doing that, but they started really early in the morning and um, we're trying to get off of the trails before the curfew. Uh, when I just went, it was five o'clock. And obviously if you're camping, that's a little bit of a different story, but in general, they don't want people out on the strenuous trails, especially towards dark. So uh, yeah, lots of people trying to get off of the trails within the curfew. So I just gave a whole lot of information there and I did mention camping. Let's take a look at the map and I'll kind of explain what some of the regulations were as far as parking and camping and uh, also show you like where each of the things I just mentioned are. I've got two maps here. This one I got from the attraction and this one I picked up at one of the outside parking areas. I got this one at Boone Fork parking area. I'll show you both really quick. This one has a lot of valuable information as far as trail descriptions, safety rules, regulations, and unlike the smaller map, it includes details of the attraction. So the attraction part you can see here in green, and then the state park, the rest of the trail system is in gray. But we're actually going to take a look at this map for the rest of the time, just because as you can see, um, the details are much clearer. It's uh, zoomed in a bit more. Right here is the swinging bridge and this line where the attraction technically starts. And then the rest of this is just a closer view of that whole trail system. So you have profile parking area. And like I mentioned, there is a restroom there and this is a larger parking lot. There's also a place to fill out your hiker registration as well as your camping permit. So let me take a quick minute to explain that. You book your campsite online and then just print or screenshot the confirmation email they send you so that when you arrive and you fill out your registration card, uh, you can write down that reservation number. There's signs all over the trails saying that just booking it online isn't enough. You have to fill out a permit. Um, it looks like this. So pretty standard hiker registration card. You just fill in uh, your vehicle information, your route, and that confirmation number that you get when you book your site online. Really not as intimidating as it sounds uh, on the signs. Same situation with Boone Fork parking area, but the actual kiosk is a little bit of a walk down the path. It's not immediately in the parking lot like at Profile parking area. And I was a little confused because I hadn't been on that side before. So quick tip, if you don't know your license plate number, uh, by heart, just take a picture of it so that when you walk that way out and reach the kiosk, you don't have to walk all the way back to get that information. Just save yourself a little bit of time and a few extra steps. I stayed here at Storyteller Rock. Honestly, all four of these sites are fantastic, especially Streamside, and there's no shortage of water there. You cross several streams, uh, very easy access to water at these four sites on this side of the park. So as far as water sources, these inner sites, all of this that I'm kind of circling here, there's no water sources. Shanty Spring is your closest thing. Profile, you pass a lot of streams getting to that site so you can get water, you know, before reaching the site. And if you feel so inclined to make a 
spur trip to Shanty Spring, you could do that. But uh, these inner sites, you got to pack in the water that you need or make a separate excursion to Shanty Spring. Daniel Boone's site, my understanding is this little stream runs near it, so uh, you have water access there. These four I mentioned earlier, no shortage of water, just streams all over the place up there. But so that's something to definitely keep in mind is if you're camping on these inner sites, water is not immediately accessible. You got to make a trip to Shanty Spring, which is a very small piped source that depending on the time of year, you know, could be a pretty decent source or just a small measly trickle. The other thing to keep in mind is many of these sites like Storyteller Rock and Streamside, these ones have a tent pad. So like a raised wooden tent pad. Same thing with Raven's Roost. Just read the description before you book the site online to find out if there's a tent pad because you'll need a freestanding tent. Uh, I also got these, which are like a spring substitute for a stake. They fit into the little slats of the tent pad and then you uh, hook up the corners of your tent to it to kind of stake it down. Now, these are great in theory, but uh, the tent pad at Raven's Roost last year was in pretty bad shape. Uh, some boards were loose and rotten. Uh, not the same situation at Storyteller Rock, but uh, they weren't exactly symmetrically spaced. So uh, some of these just would not fit between those slats, and I had to kind of jerry-rig something with extra cord. So just be mindful of that. So I just did an overnight trip, hiked a short ways into my site, Next morning, booked my ticket for the attraction, hiked back out, and uh, drove in through the entrance gate, which, like I mentioned, is down here somewhere not shown on this map. But the hiker parking lot is here. There is a short trail that you can take up to the swinging bridge and then hop onto Grandfather Trail to do the actual hike up to Callaway Peak. You can also access it using the extension trail from that hiker parking lot. But I chose to take that short, I think it's 0.4 mile trail to the bridge to check that out before starting my hike. So I took Grandfather Trail, which is blazed in blue, went up all the cables, ladders to McCray Peak, all the way up pretty much to Callaway. I did something a little bit different on the way down. I backtracked on Grandfather, but took Underwood Trail instead of going back this section of Grandfather to kind of bypass some of those cables and ladders. I only had one ladder on Underwood Trail, whereas there was a significant number I'll put on the screen. So I took Underwood, bypassed a bunch of the cables and the ladders. It was a lot of steep rocks and boulders on that way down. And then I got onto the extension trail here at this junction to drop me off directly at my car rather than at a swinging bridge. So that's kind of the route I took for my day hike. Obviously we can't go into all of the different options of how to experience Grandfather Mountain. You can do it as a day hike, you can do it as an overnight trip, heck you could turn it into a whole weekend long event, but uh, it's kind of choose your own adventure and uh, you know which trails you hike and from where is just kind of up to you and what fits you know your schedule and abilities best and that kind of brings us to the difficulty so how hard is it grandfather trail um, what i did on my trip accessing from inside the attraction like near the swinging bridge grandfather trail itself it's a beast. There are cables and ladders and crazy boulder scrambles and really steep, like almost vertical rock climbs. Um, pretty difficult, challenging stuff. It's listed as advanced on their map, on their um, like just kind of informational kiosk, and that is no joke. Grandfather Trail is uh, very, very technical and difficult. It would be impossible to get Barrett or Nora up to Callaway Peak from Grandfather Trail unless they were strapped to my back the entire time, which that's not happening. Um, now, do with this information what you will. 
when we went last year, uh, a couple did manage to get their Australian Shepherd up from Profile Trail. I guess they helped him up some of those shorter ladders towards the top. And from that side, it is uh, a little bit easier terrain, still a lot of incline and rock scrambles and things. Somebody found a way to do it from Profile and they didn't seem to be having too much trouble with their, you know, medium sized dog. But again, you know, do with that information what you will. Certainly not advice. From the other side, Boone Fork, uh, Nawati Trail was a pretty pleasant walk. Um, I haven't been all the way up Craggy View, that kind of connector to Callaway. I've been as far as uh, Raven's Roost, and I know that there were some pretty tall ladders and at least one set of cables to get down that way. I really can't recommend this park enough. It's got everything from wild backcountry adventure to beautiful scenery from the safety of the tourist attraction. So a little bit of something for everyone. And me, I like both. I like the tourist attraction of it. I also love getting out there and backpacking in the area and taking on the challenge. But if you are looking for a heart pumping, gut wrenching, unforgettable adventure, look no further than Grandfather Mountain, where wonders never cease. Tracing my footsteps through the wind.